muralist, an artist who painted big wall paintings in Mexico City. So in 1921, when the Mexican Revolution was over, um, the new Mexican Secretary of Education, his name was Jose Vasconcelos, no test on this later, I tell my students, <laughs> um, uh, but he decided that he wanted all the artists to come back from Paris um, and start working for the government to promote the new revolutionary ideals. And he invited Rivera to come back um, to paint murals in Mexico City. And Rivera said, okay, but first it's in the National Preparatory School, um, and you can very much see what he learned from Renaissance uh, mural technique. It's an allegorical mural about, um, about the new man. Um, so he's thinking it was so the figure in the center that looks like he's being a crucified Christ is actually representing the new resurrection of the new man or the mestizo, mixed heritage of indigenous and white, um, and it's the New Mexico. Um, so he's, yeah, right? He rec represents the New Mexico going forward after the revolution. All of these figures, I mean, we could spend an entire hour going through who all these figures are, but they're all allegorical figures about the arts. Um, and so they reference song and dance and theater and music and, and that kind of um, thing, so you could take it apart. Um, well, let's get to the one in the National Gallery. Um, this one, so he made it m hundreds of murals um, in Mexico City. Um, he, this one is one that is called the Rural School Teacher um, in the Secretary of Public Education. Um, and here he's starting to work towards representing um, Mexican ideals. Um, and so he... Um, it was um, painted for the Palace of Cortes. Hernán Cortes was the conquistador, the one who um, led the conquering of, Me of Mexico by the Spanish. Um, and here we have an excerpt, and the figure that we're looking at here is the agrarian leader, Emiliano Zapata, um, who was one of the Mexican revolutionary leaders and represented kind of the peasants' fight to get back their land. Um, and so Rivera was very much aligned with socialist and communist ideals and redistribution of the land, and so he's showing um, Emiliano Zapata stepping on the large landowner um, who he's killed. Um, and he's wearing white, the symbol of purity. He's got a white horse. Politics were, <laughs> his politics were um, much, oftentimes superseded his art. Uh, but he also did hundreds of murals in Mexico City. So if you go to Mexico City today, um, you can see them. There is actually one in California. Um, it's in you know, the, the Getty sponsored a restoration, um, and there are several in California as well. But he is um, he did works like this. Um, so you can see the title. You can see his politics right here up on the screen. This is a famous one. This is not a mural. It's an easel painting, um, but it's from 1930. It's called Proletarian Mother. Um, he did not idealize his subjects. He was like, this is, you know, on him. You can always rep re uh, recognize Zapata because he has the big mustache, the, the bigote, that goes like this. And then also he has the big sombrero. He always looks the way, um, it, this particular um, way. So he, he um, idolized um, Zapata. Um, Is it oh, just yes. a coincidence that the wall, both these paintings that you showed, the walls are like that? So I think the, the walls are ab about showing repression. Uh, they're about showing, you know, 1931. Um, and you can see just how good he is about ca capturing, um, you know, the, the chiseled nature of the face, the anguish of uh, anguish of a face of suffering, of of kind of he's, he's very interested in political and social uh, turmoil, um, and that was and you can see that it it rep I don't actually have a photograph to compare it to. It looks somewhat like him, but it also looks like it almost looks like an ancient Mexican carving, mm. like a Mayan or an Aztec carving. Um, and he was someone who advocated. He said to modern artists. We need to, today in Mexico City, it's in the Palacio de Bellas Artes, which is the Palace of Fine Arts, um, and it's called the New Democracy. Uh, and you can, you can, I think you're all just seeing a few of these, you can start to see his style. His figures are very, very powerful and carved, and he likes, he was really interested in foreshortening, like the way that they went into depth in space. I mean, it's not easy to do, this kind of foreshortening where they, so probably in reference to World War II, um, Siqueiros himself fought in the Spanish Civil War. He was so appalled um, with the rise of Franco and fascism and other self-portraits. So I showed you the earlier lithograph and this one. Um, and you can see his same kind of kind of powerful, the hand, this is one thing that he often does in other motif, like you were mentioning. The hands represent the strength of the power of the worker. Um, this idea of manual labor, this idea of strength and power, um, this chisel. Um, he lived most of his life in Europe, so most of his life, he, he was born in Uruguay, in Montevideo, um, but then went to Barcelona for many, many years, and then in 1920s he moved to Paris, 
Um, and he was already in his 60s when he moved to Paris. Um, he was a well, like I could do that. But, um, and Doris Garcia was very, very interested in kind of figuring out what the basic elements of a painting are. Um, and so, and there were many artists who were exploring this question um, in the 1920s and the 1930s. They were interested, you know, what, what makes up a painting? Um, and he came up with this idea that it is line, color, and shape. Um, and he tried to, and if you look at this, um, that you can see that this is a painting that is reduced down to its Next to him is Pete Mondrian, so someone maybe mm -hmm. some of you have heard of. Um, and so he was good friends with Pete Mondrian. Um, and this is a circle of, of this was at uh, Michel Seffert, who was a Belgian um, writer and critic, and he was, um, and Mondrian is here in the center, and um, um, Tori Garcia. So he was instrumental in kind of the theories and the thinking of what art was, what is abstraction in that time period. And so I wanted to show you this influence here. So on the left is a famous Mondrian. Yeah. <laughs> a composition with red, yellow, and blue, a painting reduced to its basics. It's reduced to line and shape and color. Um, and then you see Torres Garcia, same year, 1930, the two of them are in dialogue. Um, but what I love about Torres Garcia is he, so Mondrian looks like it's made with the machine. It's clearly done with a, with a straight edge. You, can, you see no evidence of the artist's hand in that work. Um, and Torres Garcia was always interested in keeping the craft, like you can see his brush strokes. You can see that this is handmade. You can see that the colors are muddy. Um, and so he try, was always thinking about this balance between the basics of painting, uh, but keeping the artist's presence. Like you see the artist here. You see his process on that. Um, but he, he quickly got bored with this totally of 1929. It was made in Paris. Um, and he started adding symbols. Um, and so he was thinking about how art conveys meaning. So you can, if you, the more you look at it, the more symbols you find. Like you can find a fish. Um, there's a clock over here. He oftentimes included boats. Um, he included houses. Um, I'm trying to, uh, this is a, like a vase shape. Oh, this is a vase shape. Sometimes the outline of a figure. Uh, but he was, he was many artists of this time period. Uh, this, this is the moment of the on the rise. Many, many, the galleries were closing, a lot of artists left. And so he'd been in Europe for more than 40 years and he went back to Uruguay in 1933 um, and 34. And so this is him returning to Uruguay. And then he started to spread his ideas in Montevideo and in Buenos Aires and all the things that he learned. Um, but interestingly, he then starts to engage with Latin American motifs. So he made this monument in, in Montevideo in, in 1938, um, and he starts to look at Latin American sources. And so I'm comparing it here. I just got to go here this summer, and it is outside of La Paz in Bolivia. Um, this is the Sun Gate of Tiwanaku um, in Bolivia, and he's looking at how ancient American civilizations used grids and symbols, um, and how this was not just a European invention, but aligned with the ancient historical past in Latin America and across. So. I have one more artist. Should I keep going or stop? Like all these other artists, he went to Europe. He, um, he studied with the famous architect, Le Corbusier. Um, he hated Le Corbusier. Um, and he, he, felt, he felt Le Corbusier was way too structured. Um, and then he very soon met the Surrealists and he said, aha, this is my family. Um, you know, this is where I want to be and a kind of foreground and sky, um, but there's very rarely anything recognizable in his figures. <laughs> I just wanted to compare this to a French, um, this is André Masson, who is a French surrealist. So that this is another example of automatism. Um, and I also just wanted to show you this, um, that, that Mata, um, he, uh, he had a second last name, was Echuren, Echuren uh, Chaurin, um, and he was exhibited with anguish, swirling, um, things feel like they're exploding out of control, um, and that's that feeling of response to it. Um, and here's the one that's owned by the National Gallery. So it's right around the same time. It's called Genesis um, of 1942. Um, and so you have these some of these same um, feelings of automatic drawing uh, that are um, in, in, the, in the kind of picture that you've got. There are a few references. Um, so in 1941, he traveled to Mexico City um, and he saw the pyramids at uh, Teotihuacan. Um, so those are perhaps references to the pyramids when he traveled to Mexico City. Um, but he was also, so just kind of look here at all these grid lines. Um, he was also very, very good friends with Marcel Duchamp. Um, and they were kind of collaborators of much of time. And so this is the famous Marcel Duchamp, the, the large glass that's in the Philadelphia Museum. 
Um, if you don't know the story of this work, this is a work that Marcel Duchamp made. He sent it for exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum. <laughs> um, but you can see that you can hardly get into the space. And so some of Mata's paintings are a play on um, this kind of, of the playfulness of, of Duchamp. So that was actually what the Thank mm -hmm. you.
on some free performances in the parks, <laughs> which is way different <laughs> than a stage, but yeah. So yeah. what type of, I don't like to use the word style, like can you yeah. tell me more about, I want to hear the story, like I felt amazing things as you were walking by, oh. but, but can you share what your experience, like what are you sharing with us? I know what I got, what were you? I, okay? Well, so we so we set because it was such a quick turnaround. We do have some other works that are set work. This is more improvisational work, um, and we also have a larger group of people, which would not fit in this space. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided to work a little improvisationally with the painting. Um, and I don't know. For me, I was using when I started this movement, and then I was taking. We had a structure of where we were moving in the space, which I think I accidentally messed up a little in the beginning. <laughs> 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 but, um, but I also was sort of tracking maybe what was here. I also keep track of what's in my head, like as I'm moving through the space, what movements I'm working with. And then as they entered and we were moving together, I took some of their movement and sort of adapted it and try to shape it into my own phrase work that I was working within. The improvisation. So, can I ask the other ladies? Would be a, like, yeah, yes. share what what were you sharing with us? I think I was also looking for a connection, like within the space and the audience, and then also the other dancers. Um, like, and sort similar to what Roxanne said, finding movements that others are doing and adapting them, but also where where am I looking in the space? You know, am I seeing what Roxanne's doing? Am I seeing what Jenny's doing? Um, where's my projection kind of going? So sort of that feeling as well, in addition to the things that you were saying, and definitely pulling from this. Like I was trying to feel these shapes, um, and just some of the energy that it has. Yeah. yeah, I like to look at the paintings, and then I kind of like to look at who's in the painting, and kind of see, like put myself in that, that painting. And so I take the colors and how the colors make me feel, and then why are they making that shape, and I try to pull that in with my emotions and then when I'm dancing with others I like to feel kind of what their mm -hmm. shapes are feeling and kind of connect through that and my relationship to that. Yeah. I think I did a little bit with you and um, we weren't doing any sort of weight bearing but it felt right to sort of mm -hmm. have that connection in the moment I don't know really mm -hmm. why. Our, um, when we were working it through we were thinking about um, working in and around each other so that yeah, in the negative space of each other, and then working, I was using movement that I had started thinking about individually, and then trying to put that in with Sarah and, and Jimmy to, to connect that together. Yeah, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that partner stuff is tricky in the moment, but. Yeah. I think too, it's a matter of uh, like connection and trust again, because we have all danced together a lot. And so I think even though it's not necessarily planned, it doesn't feel scary to be that close to someone because you have a good sense of trust and like they're not gonna you know kick me in the face or I can trust them with my weight or with where I want to go in the direction of the movement. Yeah right? yeah I think also the eye contact like mm -hmm. when I went to do that or touch I think it was mm -hmm. you. Yeah. I look I can't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I made eye contact yeah. with you to let you know that that was coming yeah. which is also really important when mm -hmm. working together so. The way you were using your hands Especially with all three of you were there together, mm -hmm. and like you, you all of you used a negative space. It was beautiful the, the way you were doing it, and I thought it was choreographed. I didn't oh, realize really? till now. Oh, that's awesome. I thought that was your plan. Oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it was a plan. Good things. The ladies just flow together. The spontaneous. Oh, yeah, plan. I really do. It was a spontaneous plan. That's yeah. exactly. <laughs> right. I like that. Are yeah. you familiar with? Uh, Jane Franklin dance? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I actually danced for her for a little bit. Oh, I did too. Did you? Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. That's awesome. Um, you know, they've done some 